Hello everyone, welcome to the next section of the course, Clean Up Your Code. In this section, we will start with JSX, Babel and its importance. Then we will discover the main features of JSX and the differences between HTML and JSX. Further, we will learn about best practices to write JSX. Post that we move to linting and ESLint. Lastly, we will cover the basics of functional programming along with its importance and uses. Now we move on to the first video of this section that deals with JSX. In this video, we are going to declare our elements inside our components using JSX. React provides two ways to define our elements. The first one is by using JavaScript functions and the second one is by using JSX, an optional XML-like syntax. Here is the example section of the official react.js website. JSX is one of the main reasons why people fail to approach React because looking at the examples on the home page and seeing JavaScript mixed with HTML for the first time seems strange to most of us. As soon as we get used to it, we realise that it is very convenient, precisely because it is similar to HTML and looks very familiar to anyone who has already created UIs on the web. The opening and closing tags make it easier to represent nested trees of elements, something that would have been unreadable and hard to maintain using plain JavaScript. In order to use JSX and some features of ES2015 in our code, we have to install Babel. We use Babel to write our scripts in JSX and ES2015, and when we are ready to ship, we compile the sources into ES5, the standard specification implemented in major browsers today. Note that Babel is a popular JavaScript compiler widely adopted within the React community. Babel can compile ES2015 code into ES5 JavaScript, as well as compile JSX into JavaScript functions. The process is called transpilation. Using it is pretty straightforward. We install it globally using this command. When the installation is complete, we can run this command to compile any JavaScript file. One of the reasons Babel is so powerful is because it is highly configurable. Babel is just a tool to transpile a source file into an output file but to apply some transformations, we need to configure it. Luckily, there are some very useful presets of configurations, which we can easily install and use. So first, we install preset ES2015. Post that we install preset Babel React command. Once the installation is complete, we create a configuration file called .babelrc in the root folder. Let's open the root directory. Here we have installed Babel preset ES2015 and Babel preset React. Within the root folder, we create a new file and enter these lines into it to tell Babel to use those presets. From this point on, we can write ES2015 and JSX in our source files and execute the output files in the browser. Moving on to Hello World. Now that our environment has been set up to support JSX, we can dive into the most basic example that is generating a div element. This is how you would create a div with React's create element function. And this tag is the JSX for creating a div element. It looks similar to regular HTML. The big difference is that we are writing the markup inside a JS file but it is important to note that JSX is only syntactic sugar and it gets transpiled into JavaScript before being executed in the browser. In fact, our div is translated into react.createElement div when we run Babel, which is something we should always keep in mind when we write our templates. Next, we explore about DOM elements and React components. With JSX, we can create both HTML elements and React components, the only difference is whether or not they start with a capital letter. For example, to render an HTML button, we use button tag, while to render our button components, we use button tag with a capital B. The first button is transpiled into this code. The second one is transpiled into this code. The difference here is that in the first call, we are passing the type of the DOM element as a string, while in the second call, 
we are passing the component itself, which means that it should exist in the scope to work. JSX is very convenient when your DOM elements or React components have props. In fact, using XML is pretty easy to set attributes on elements. Let's create a new XML file. Our code looks like this. The similar code in JavaScript would look like this. This is far less readable, and even with only a couple of attributes, it is harder to read without a bit of reasoning. Let's proceed with children. JSX allows you to define children to describe the tree of elements and compose complex UIs. A basic example is a link with text inside it as you can view it on the screen. This would be transpiled into this block of code. Our link can be enclosed inside a div for some layout requirements, and it can be achieved with this JSX code snippet. The JavaScript equivalent code looks like this. It should now be clear how the XML-like syntax of JSX makes everything more readable and maintainable, but it is always important to know the JavaScript parallel of our JSX in order to have control over the creation of elements. The good part is that we are not limited to having elements as children of elements but we can use JavaScript expressions such as functions or variables. To do this, we just have to enclose expression within curly braces. So here, we add a code snippet and make sure that it encloses within braces. The same applies to non-string attributes, as you can see here. Post that we move on to differences with HTML. So far, we have looked at the similarities between JSX and HTML. Let's now look at the little differences between them and the reasons they exist. So first difference is attributes. We must always keep in mind that JSX is not a standard language and that it gets transpiled into JavaScript. Because of this, some attributes cannot be used. Take an example. In this line of code, instead of class, we have used class name and instead of for, we have used HTML for. The reason for this is that class and for are reserved words in JavaScript. Next difference is style. A pretty significant difference is the way the style attribute works. The style attribute does not accept a CSS string as the HTML parallel does, but it expects a JS object where the style names are camel cased. Moving on to the next difference, and that is root. One important difference with HTML worth mentioning is that since JSX elements get translated into JavaScript functions, and you cannot return two functions in JavaScript, whenever you have multiple elements at the same level, you are forced to wrap them into a parent. Let's look at a simple example. This code will give us this error. On the other hand, the code written in this manner will work. It is pretty annoying to have to add unnecessary div tags just to make JSS work, but React developers are trying to find a solution. You can view it on the GitHub page using this web link. There's one thing that could be a little tricky in the beginning, and again it concerns the fact that we should always keep in mind that JSX is not HTML, even if it has an XML-like syntax. In fact, JSX handles the spaces between text and elements differently from HTML in a way that's counterintuitive. Let's consider this snippet. In the browser, which interprets HTML, this code would give you foobar baz, which is exactly what we expect. In JSX, instead, the same code will be rendered as foobar baz, which is because the three nested lines get transpiled as individual children of the div element without taking the spaces into account. A common solution to get the same output is putting a space explicitly between the elements. The code snippets after adding spaces would look like this. As you may have noticed, we are using an empty string wrapped inside a JavaScript expression to force the compiler to apply the space between the elements. A couple more things worth mentioning before starting for real regarding the way you define Boolean attributes in JSX. If you set an attribute without a value, JSX assumes that its value is true following the same behavior of the HTML disabled attribute, for example. This means that if we want to set an attribute to false, we have to declare it explicitly as false, as you can see in these lines of code. 
Let's take another example. Observing these lines of code, it can be confusing in the beginning because we may think that omitting an attribute would mean false, but it is not like that. With React, we should always be explicit to avoid confusion. An important feature is the spread attributes operator, which comes from the rest spread properties for ECMA script proposal, which you can get on this website and is very convenient whenever we want to pass all the attributes of a JavaScript object to an element. A common practice that leads to fewer bugs is not to pass entire JavaScript objects down to children by reference, but to use their primitive values, which can be easily validated, making components more robust and error-proof. Let's take an example. We enter these lines of code into an editor. Now this code gets transpiled into the new version of code. Further, we proceed with JavaScript templating. Finally, we started with the assumption that one of the advantages of moving the templates inside our components instead of using an external template library are that we can use the full power of JavaScript. The spread attribute is an example of that. And another common example is that JavaScript expressions can be used as attributes values by enclosing them within curly braces. As you can view in this line of code snippet. So, the first pattern is multi-line. Let's start with a very simple one. As stated previously, one of the main reasons we should prefer JSX over React's create element is because of its XML-like syntax and because balanced opening and closing tags are perfect to represent a tree of nodes. Therefore, we should try to use it in the right way and get the most out of it. Add this block of code as an example. Whenever we have nested elements, we should always go multi-line. This is preferable version of the previous code. The exception is if the children are not elements, such as text or variables, in that case, it makes sense to remain on the same line and avoid adding noise to the markup, as you can view in this code snippet. Always remember to wrap your elements inside parentheses when you write them in multiple lines. In fact, JSX always gets replaced by functions, and functions written on a new line can give you an unexpected result because of automatic semicolon insertion. Suppose, for example, you are returning JSX from your render method which is how you create UIs in React. This example works fine because the div is on the same line as the return. This code, however, is not right. The reason for this is because you would have the code to be presented like this. This is why you have to wrap the statement in parentheses. Next pattern is multi-properties. A common problem in writing JSX comes when an element has multiples attributes. One solution is to write all the attributes on the same line, but this would lead to very long lines, which we do not want in our code. Let's include this block of code and observe a common solution. That is, to write each attribute on a new line with one level of indentation, and then align the closing bracket with the opening tag. Things get more interesting when we start working with conditionals, for example, if we want to render some components only when certain conditions are matched. The fact that we can use JavaScript in our conditions is a big plus, but there are many different ways to express conditions in JSX. Suppose we want to show a logout button only if the user is currently logged into our application. A simple snippet to start with is this. This code will function well, but it is not very readable, especially if there are multiple components and multiple conditions. In JSX, we can use an inline condition. This works because if the condition is false, nothing gets rendered, but if the condition is true, the create element function of the login button gets called and the element is returned to compose the resulting tree. If the condition has an alternative, that is the classic if else statement, and we want, for example, to show a logout button if the user is logged in and a login button otherwise, we can use JavaScript's if else condition, as you can see here. Alternatively, and better, we can use a multiple condition, which makes the code more compact. That should look like this code snippet. You can find the multiple conditions used in popular repositories such as the Redux Real World example, which can be visited on this web link, where the multiple is used to show a loading label if the component is fetching the data, or load more inside a button depending on the value of the isFetching variable. This code is an example for isFetching variable. Let's now look at the best solution for when things get more complicated. Take an example. 
In this block of code, we have to check more than one variable to determine whether to render a component or not. In this code snippet, it is clear that using the inline condition is a good solution, but the readability is strongly impacted. Instead, we can create a helper function inside our component and use it in JSX to verify the condition. As you can see, this change makes the code more readable and the condition more explicit. If you do not like using functions, you can use an object's getters, which make the code more elegant. For example, here, instead of declaring a function, we define a getter. The same applies to computed properties. Suppose you have two single properties for currency and value. Instead of creating the price string inside your render method, you can create a class function. This is better because it is isolated and you can easily test it in case it contains logic. Alternatively, you can go a step further and use getters function. Going back to conditional statements, there are other solutions that require using external dependencies. A good practice is to avoid external dependencies as much as we can to keep our bundle smaller, but it may be worth it in this particular case because improving the readability of our templates is a big win. The first solution is render if, which we can install with this command. We can then easily use it in our projects with these lines of code. As you can see, we wrap our conditions inside the render if function. The utility function that gets returned can be used as a function which receives the JSX markup to be shown when the condition is true. One goal we should always keep in mind is to never add too much logic inside our components. Some of them will require a bit of it, but we should try to keep them as simple as possible so that we can easily spot and fix errors. We should at least try to keep the render if method as clean as possible, and to do that, we can use another utility library called React Only If, which lets us write our components as if the condition is always true by setting the conditional function using a higher order component. They are functions that receive a component and return an enhanced one by adding some properties or modifying its behavior. To use the library, we just need to install it with this command. Once it is installed, we can use it in our apps this way. As you can see here, there is no logic at all inside the component itself. We pass the condition as the first parameter of the only if function, and when the condition is matched, the component rendered. The function used to validate the condition receives the props, state, and context of the component. In this way, we avoid polluting our component with conditionals so that it is easier to understand and reason about. Proceeding that we have loops. A very common operation in UI development is to display lists of items. When it comes to showing lists, using JavaScript as a template language. If we write a function that returns an array inside our JSX template, each element of the array gets compiled into an element. Let's dive into a real world example. Suppose you have a list of users, each one with a name property attached to it. To create an unordered list to show the users, you can use this code. This snippet is incredibly simple and incredibly powerful at the same time, where the power of the HTML and JavaScript converge. Now we move on to control statements. Conditionals and loops are very common operations in UI templates, and you may feel wrong using the JavaScript multiple or the map function to perform them. In general, we aim to remove all the logic from our components, and especially from our render methods, but sometimes we have to show and hide elements according to the state of the application, and very often we have to loop through collections and arrays. If you feel that using JSX for that kind of operation will make your code more readable, there is a Babel plugin available to do just that, JSX Control Statements. This goes through the same philosophy as JSX, and it does not add any real functionality to the language. It is just syntactic sugar that gets compiled into JavaScript. Let's see how we can execute the controlled statement. First of all, we have to install it with this command. Once it is installed, we have to add this plugin to the list of our Babel plugins in our Babel RC file. Save the file. A conditional statement written using the plugin looks like this snippet, 
this gets transpiled into a multiple expression with this line of code. The if component is great, but if for some reason you have nested conditions in your render method, it can easily become messy and hard to follow. Here is where the choose component comes in handy. This is the block of code for choose component. Finally, you can see that there is a component to manage the loops which is also very convenient. This code gets transpiled into a map function. If you are used to using linters, you might wonder why the linter is not complaining about that code. In fact, the variable user does not exist before the transpilation, nor is it wrapped into a function. To avoid those linting errors, there is another plugin to install, ESLint plugin JSX control statements. Moving on to the last subtopic, subrendering. We always want to keep our components very small and our render methods very clean and simple. However, that is not an easy goal, especially when you are creating an application iteratively and in the first iteration you are not sure exactly how to split the components into smaller ones. So, what should we be doing when the render method becomes too big to maintain? One of the solutions is to split it into smaller functions in a way that lets us keep all the logic in the same component. Let's look at an example. Entering this block of code, we observe that it is not always considered a best practice because it seems more obvious to split the component into smaller ones. However, sometimes it helps just to keep the render method cleaner. For example, in the Redux real world examples, a sub render method is used to render the load more buttons. Now that we are JSX power users, it is time to move on and see how to follow a style guide within our code to make it consistent. In this video, we have successfully learned about JSX, JavaScript templating and common patterns.